Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi. Today, I'm very excited because we have a very special guest here today. It is the one, the only, Dr. Victoria, and she has a show on our podcast, so make sure you go to see her show. It's under our channel, and she is an excellent doctor that has a lot of knowledge and expertise, and today she's going to talk about libido. So all your questions and answers and things that you want to know about women's libido and everything that you need to know is in this episode. So keep your ears on and listen carefully, because Dr. Victoria has a special episode just for you. So it's amazing to have you back. I love when you come on this show. You you know, you have so much great stuff to share with our audience. And especially today when it's, when you talk about libido, it's something that, you know, women especially at certain ages go through. And I know from my own personal uh, life, I started having problems with my libido from the moment I had childbirth. Um, my body started to change. When I had my first child, C-section, body changed completely. And, you know, as soon as they opened me up, that was it. And I hear people going through perimenopause, 39 mm -hmm. years old, you know, and then there are women who don't go through it until their 60s. But then you hear people talking about how they don't feel as sexual anymore, how they're having a hard time orgasm, and how they don't feel as attractive anymore. Moods, this, that, you know, there's so much going on. So, you know, what are some of the things, the common factors of libido and, and things that you hear a lot from your clients? And what are some of the things that we could do to help ourselves, you know, get back to the way we used to be? Because that's every, what everyone's dream is. We want to just feel like the way we used to be. We don't have to want to deal with this crap anymore. You know, it's right. like getting older is not always fun, but, you know, if we know the ins and outs and things we could do to help ourselves, you know, it can make life so much better. Well, that's definitely true. I think there's a lot more research and a lot more out there for, you know, men who are having like erectile dysfunction or issues with sexual function in general. And what I've learned from working with women is that women are a little bit more complex, mm -hmm. right? I can have, I can see five women in a day and if they're complaining about low libido, they might all be for different reasons, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to like start out so that people, you know, feel a little bit more comfortable just kind of saying like libido is more of sexual desire, right? Like your desire for sex and everybody's libido is different. I don't think that there's a right or wrong, uh, you know, kind of number of how many times a month you're supposed to be having sex. I think that it's mostly like whatever you're comfortable with but mm -hmm. then also when does it become a problem? Like when should you see someone is okay. when you are unhappy, right? Like I wish I was having more sex or I wish I had more desire. Like that's when you kind of know that there's an issue that maybe you should be addressing. Um, because there's two sides to like women's sexual function. It's the desire. Yes. But then you have like the arousal part, right? Which is yes. like the physical part. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to separate those two because they are different. And when you're having issues with arousal, it can be from pain, right? Um, because as you get older or even after you have kids, right, you're going to have changes and fluctuations in estrogen specifically. So yeah. you might not have enough lubrication, which can be causing more friction, thus more pain with <laughs> sex. Um, if you had like, uh, which they don't really do anymore, but episiotomy, right? Like any like surgical procedure, right. um, that can cause that. And some women also during the perimenopause and menopause phase find that they don't have orgasms as easily, right? So mm -hmm. maybe like it's not painful, but you know, the time to orgasm is like non-existent or it's just taking a lot longer. So then you're getting in your head and then you're getting really frustrated. Um, and obviously like that's not fun, yes. right? So mm -hmm. maybe like focusing on the physiological parts, right? Because that's like more, I guess, hormonal based. Mm -hmm. um, so when we talk about the changes as far as like the dryness or atrophy, vaginal atrophy that can happen, yeah, um, that's from loss of estrogen. Uh, one of the things that you can do for that, which I think we're really like underusing, and I've said this before, but it's the vaginal estrogen. Yeah. Right. Because uh, one of the great things about vaginal estrogen which I've gotten into discussions with other doctors before about this, but mm -hmm. if you look it up, you know, you don't have a lot of systemic absorption. Right. So I can have a patient who like maybe isn't the best candidate for hormonal replacement therapy, but she can still be on 
uh, the vaginal estrogen, and that can help not only with lubrication, which can help with sexual function. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's that easy. Like that's sometimes like the only thing they need, Right. but there are other benefits to it. One, as a woman gets older, she has increased risk of UTIs. It'll decrease your risk of UTIs. But the other thing that we don't really talk about a lot is that, you know, some women will experience like urinary frequency or a little bit of incontinence. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just having the vaginal estrogen can help with that as well. Yeah. Right. So I know we're talking about sex, but like the vaginal estrogen definitely helps with a lot of other things. And I think that we're kind of underutilizing that. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't know, I don't know why I think we'll get there, but, um, I think that that would be like the first thing I would try with someone if they're coming in and it's just like, they're having like pain or some dryness. But I think the other thing, uh, I'm a huge advocate for pelvic pain, like pelvic therapy, right? Mm If you're someone who has like pelvic pain, -hmm. Yeah. maybe you're not sure like why you're having pelvic pain, you know, are your muscles too tight or too lax? Like, is there something else going on? Um, I've been to pelvic therapy. I think it's an amazing resource. And I think that that's where you start if you don't know what's going on. Right. I think it's so important too. And even with, when, when I was going into menopause, I was, you know, experiencing problems with dryness and I was experiencing problems with pain and I was experiencing, you know, pressure and incontinence and constantly feeling like I have to go to the bathroom. And it was just like crazy and getting symptoms of UTIs when I didn't have UTIs. And it was like, I didn't know what was going on. I actually went to a urologist and the urologist gave me vaginal estrogen. And Mm. that made a humongous difference. It was like all of a sudden, slowly, things started to change and I got better and better and better. And then the symptoms went away and I started to feel back to normal. And it, it, it does vaginal estrogen does make a huge difference. It should be used more because you a lot of people don't utilize it as much, you know, as, as they should. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that. And I just want, you know, I've had patients who I put them on it and if it doesn't work in like a week or two weeks, they're like, this doesn't work. But I mean, you're kind of trying to regenerate tissue there. So you want to give it at least three months before you say that it doesn't work. Um, And that there are also different formulations. Like I've had, you know, recently I had a woman and she's like, you know, it's giving me like a weird like vaginal like odor. And it was like, she was using the cream. Like there are different formulations of it. So just because, you know, the one that you got wasn't working for you, you can get, get it compounded to be different. Right. Um, And then, you know, she ended up having resolution of her symptoms, but it's just to say that. Um, just because it doesn't work the first time or like the first week doesn't mean that that's not going to be an option for you. And then one of the other things that I kind of wanted to touch base on was that things are going to change in terms Mm -hmm. of like how quickly you reach orgasm, right? Mm -hmm. That like that might change. Um, So that might just be you know, maybe you need a little bit more foreplay for some people, or it's just that you need to just be patient with yourself and not get frustrated Mm -hmm. that it is taking a little bit longer. One of the things is not just like age and decreased uh, circulation, right? Decreased blood flow, but you also have to consider um, like, do you have any medical conditions that can decrease blood flow to the area? One of the, like the common ones being like high blood pressure or diabetes, right? That can enhance that could cause that. And so we have previously discussed, and we were talking about earlier before the show about like the O shot, which Mm -hmm. was something that I recently learned about. But, um, for those of you that don't know, it is a PRP injection and they take it from you and then they inject it into the clitoris vaginal area. Um, lots of benefits with that is because with the PRP, you're also regenerating the tissue, but it also creates like smaller, um, blood vessels to the area to enhance blood flow. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it was interesting when I read about the O shot, it's just, it kind of confirms and reaffirms that blood flow is important, right? Yes. Um, which is, and that's obviously something that's changing as we age. So that's something yeah. to consider. Um, Cause I know I do a lot of fertility work. And one of the things that we talk about is like exercising to increase blood flow, like throughout your body. Yeah. So I think that that's definitely something um, that we also don't talk about when we're talking about like female, like yeah. sexual function. Um, so I know that you, you know, we've talked about that before and what your thoughts are on the O shot. I, I thought the O shot was great. I, you know, the first time that I got the O shot, the O shot lasted me about five years, supposed to only last about a year. 
but I had to the full effect for five years. And then I went back for another one after five years, but it, you know, I'm probably one of the abnormal ones because usually they say it lasts about a year, but I, I had the full effect for, for, uh, for five years. They just, they, they took the blood from that area. They, they, um, they put it in a tube, they spun the blood, they separated the plasma from the blood And then they took the plasma and they injected it into the uh, clitoris and then they, they injected it into the vaginal canal. And, you know, it takes a while. It had like a Cinderella effect and Mm. then you start seeing changes. And, and, and it's, it's, it was like a, for me, it was a game changer. You know, it was like, it was one of the best procedures I could have done. And it made it, it made a huge difference in how I felt and, you know, and I was able to feel back to my normal self, which, you know, for a long time, I didn't have those feelings, you know, and it was just, you know, my body going through so many different changes for so many different reasons. You know, I was just having a lot of complications for, for a, a, a ton of different reasons. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm glad that, you know, we had talked about that previously because I think that, uh, it also seems pretty safe. So that's, something that I would definitely, you know, recommend more going forward. But the other thing that you can use topically is uh, testosterone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can use it topically actually to the area. Yes. Mm -hmm. But but they recommend first, like putting it on your thigh and that doesn't work than like using it topically over your clitoris, um, because that also enhances and increases sensitivity. But the thing with testosterone is that that would be an off-label use for testosterone since it's not FDA approved for that. So you'd have to go to a doctor who's comfortable like managing um, testosterone in women. Yes. And then I use that also. So I use the cream for testosterone and um, it's just, you just have to go for consistent blood work and they just have to make sure you're balanced within a certain range. But as long as you're good with going for blood work and you really, honestly, you when you're at a certain age, you should consistently go for blood work because you're deficient and your body continues to be deficient in certain areas. And you want to know what those areas are so you can replenish your body with those mm-hmm. vitamins and supplements and, and make sure your hormones are balanced and You know, so the more you you go for blood work, um, the better you will feel because then your doctor could actually, you know, watch your hormones and and balance you the way you're supposed to be balanced. Because you could be for the longest time, you you know, I was I was good for testosterone. I was good for progesterone. Then it dropped completely to barely anything. And then later on, you know, I started to get a little bit low on estrogen and I never needed estrogen before. But then I need I started to need a little bit later on. So. So your body is consistently changing, you know, so people should always consider consistently going for checkups, especially women when it comes to libido. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and that's like the, the sensation part, but the testosterone is also good for people who have like lower desire, right? Yes. Uh, And I think that one of the things that's also overlooked is how like women also have testosterone, right? We talk about doing testosterone injections in men or topically, um, but like nobody talks about how important it is for women to have testosterone too, because as much as it affects like topically, right? And sensation, and it can enhance that for people who are like, I just don't have any desire. It can help in that arena as well. Yeah. That, and again, it, it depends, right? Someone comes to me, I'm kind of trying to figure out like, is it desire or is it like a physical issue. Right. Right. And if it is desire, one of the first things that I'll do is check their testosterone and see like, okay, like, do we have room for improvement here? Because it really doesn't take that long when you start using the testosterone for people uh, to start feeling like, okay, like something's happening here and I, I feel better. I, you know, I want to have sex with my partner. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's, I guess it helps in both areas there. Yeah. Oh, I think so. Definitely. Definitely. And I also noticed that when you take the supplement maca, it, it actually, it helps a lot too. When it comes to desire, I think it, it I, I noticed for myself personally, it enhanced the desire also and it increased the libido. Yeah. I've heard that for, for men and women. Um, mm-hmm. I haven't really used it too much in, in my practice, but I have heard people say that. Um, and there are newer supplements uh, and I'm probably going to butcher like the names, but there are like Shilajit uh, or Shilajit is a supplement that they're using now that can help increase testosterone in men. Um, So, I mean, women can use it as well. But then the other thing is um, ashwagandha can actually help with testosterone levels. But if you look at ashwagandha, that's interesting. And that brings us to one of the issues for like that kills desire. Stress kills desire. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Um, so that's interesting how the ashwagandha helps probably cause it's helping bring down your cortisol. Yeah. And if you are stressed and I've said this like so many times, but if you are stressed that directly impacts your sex hormones. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think that, um, like at, le- at least in my clinic, I see women who are going through transitions yeah. can be stressful. So like, if you just had a baby, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's a stressful transition. If you're going through perimenopause or menopause, like that yeah. can be a stressful transition. Um, and so we overlook sometimes like the, what stress is playing in those situations. Yeah. Um, because I mean, like I tell people, like I had a mom of three one time and she's just like, I just don't know. Like, you know, my husband wants to have sex and I don't know why I'm like, well, you have like three kids and you're tired all the time. Like who wants to have sex when they're tired? Yeah. Right. (laughs) So, I mean, yes, you got to look at the hormones, but also understand that like stress is going to be one of the killers. Um, and the other thing is medications, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, for sure. There, there are medications that are like notorious for causing uh, low libido. One of them very popularly released, um, prescribed is SSRIs in women, right? Mm-hmm. Like the antidepressant and anti-anxiety yes. medications. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not really sure if we have that conversation with women when we put them on SSRIs. Right. But um, that one's infamous for that. And then there's a lot of people you have like on beta blockers, like metoprolol, which can also like inhibit desire. So yeah. um, that's one of the things that I look at, like when someone comes in and they're like, hey, like I'm having this issue, like we need to mm-hmm. do a medication assessment. I don't think I don't think I've ever been to a doctor when they prescribe medications and, and they've gone over the symptoms of what, what it could possibly cause or common symptoms, you know, that this medication can cause. Usually you have to do that homework on yourself when they should they should be it should be more accessible. You know, a doctor should spend a couple of minutes to go over maybe some common, you know, um, symptoms that you could, you know, develop if you when you start to take a certain medication, because a lot of times they just write a prescription, they give it to you, you go to the, doc, you know, you go to pharmacy, you get it, but you don't realize that, oh, it's, this might actually take my desire to have sex, you know, away completely, you know, or I'm not going to feel, you know, the same way I did before, you know, um, most of the time they don't tell you, you know, and, and it's just like, you know, and then sometimes people don't understand. They just think it's coming to be with it because of age and, and they don't realize it's actually the medications they're taking. Exactly. Yeah. And that's like another thing I, I don't, think that just because you get older, like, it's just like, okay, to be like, okay, well, like it is what it is because there are things that you can do, um, to increase, you know, desire and like sexual function. And, um, so one of the medications that I was surprised to see that is out in the market, like FDA approved is one of the peptides. So it's called, um, Valisi on the market. Um, but it's bromelanotide. It's okay. one of the peptides that you use. And that one um, is an injectable, but you inject it like 45 minutes before, you know, you're planning on having sex with your partner right. and the effects can last like 12 to 16 hours. Right. So that's something like peptides I love in my clinic. One of the other peptides that does not directly uh, impact libido, but can help is sermorelin, which is a growth hormone um, peptide. Mm-hmm. I mean, that one normally I use like for people who are having like low energy or if they're like on uh semaglutide Mm -hmm. because it helps maintain muscle mass. But one of the side effects is that it can increase libido. Okay. Um, So that's one that you can use for that. And then the other one was um, Addy is -hmm. a pill, which they they actually did the studies for that one on perimenopausal women specifically. And that's like a daily pill that you can take, which um, can help with desire. So those were like the ones that I saw that were approved. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I think like the other thing that I talk about in my clinic and it's, you know, you kind of like feel it out and patient dependent is like relational issues, Mm -hmm. right? Because that's something that, um, I think especially during, again, those transitions, like when you're after having a baby, but then also in perimenopause, um, I have women who are like struggling in relationship yeah, or, and they, they don't really want to admit it. They'll like, they'll come to me and they'll be like, Hey, like, yeah, my libido is low. And mm-hmm. then you just start asking questions and then you're like, mm, there's like a disconnect yeah. here. Mm-hmm. So maybe we need to talk about that as well. Um, so yeah, there's just like a lot. And that's like for, for the desire part that can oh, also yeah. kill the desire. I think when you bring a new child into the world, so many things change and the stress of just taking care of a newborn and, you know, and then having all your other responsibilities could definitely kill sex and then just being tired alone, 
can yeah. kill your desire and kill your performance in bed for both the man and the woman, you know? So it's, it's really, you know, there's so many different, like you said, there's so many different factors. And when we were talking about supplements, I was just thinking about, you know, there's been several companies that have approached me that they actually use CBD now as a suppository to put up your vaginal canal. And it's, it's because of calmness, because most women mm. are, you know, feeling edgy and the, and the CBD suppository will bring you to a level of calmness after a certain amount of minutes. And then most women were finding that it was helpful because it made them feel calm. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can see that too. I mean, also, I mean, you've seen it maybe or maybe not, but like when you go on like a date night and you're like, mm, have a glass of wine and then you're calm and you're like, wow, he looks good now, you know? Like, <laughs> so it's just like, I can see where, where that, uh, where that happens. Uh, but I also tell like, and this I've told my friends and I've told my patients is I also think that sometimes getting a reset is helpful. Yeah. Like if you go away for a weekend, right. Yeah. Uh, because you'll be at home and like you have to do laundry or, or the kids or, or whatever excuse yeah. that you have when you're home. Right. But then like when you go and even if it's just a weekend or one night, but you know, you're not home and those responsibilities are not there. Yeah. I think that that can help. Right. Like kind of like oh, yeah. rebuild the, the connections because I have uh, like even friends who they're trying to get pregnant but the desire is completely gone because like they're tracking their periods and like everything is currently like super stressful because yeah. they really want to have the baby. I'm like, just go away for the weekend. Right. Right. Like yeah. sometimes it's just like a matter of changing the scenery. Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think, I think, you know, it's so important when they, people get married or they're planning on having children do that date night, you know, go out, relax, you know, be able to, you know, um, go on a vacation, even if it's like a three day vacation, a weekend vacation, those I think are such great resets and they could help so much in the relationship and even bring the desire up. Sometimes when you're away with your, your, the loved one, you, you just start to see things that you haven't seen in a while because you've been too busy or yeah. too stressed, you know, or too tired. And now, and then you're, you're away and you don't have to do anything. Now you can focus on the person that you fell in love with and, re you know, remember why you fell in love with that person. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so I just wanted to bring that in because I think that, like at least what I see is that people come and they're like, I just want this quick fix. But sometimes you have to like just examine all the things, right? Like yeah. first is a desire, right? Or is it something that's wrong? Like, am I having pain? Right. And then after that, it's like, okay, how do I feel with my partner? Yeah. Right. Or, or do we have a lot going on? Do we need to like reconnect? Um, because I think that's part of it too. And then it sometimes it's like a stepwise thing, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for some women, it might be both. Maybe they're right. having pain and their desire is low. Yeah. Right. So then you start with, you know, one thing and then add another and just kind of like build up on that as well. And then, you know, like when it comes to like being impatient, yeah, I remember like three months, I just start to feel a very, very slight change. And then six months, I felt a little bit more. Nine months, I started feeling a more significant change. So really, it takes time, like, and every person has, is on a different speed. So it depends mm -hmm. on your body, it depends on your how, if you're taking medications and blah, 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 blah. But you know, most most of the time, they say a minimum, a minimum of three months before you start really noticing change, because you know, people who are looking to have that one week fix is most likely it's not going to happen. No, no, it really doesn't. And, you know, this is something that I say in my clinic to my patients is like touch base with me, right? Because you can always pivot, right? Yeah. Uh, like if the estrogen is not working for some people, I've had it where the estrogen doesn't work, but you can actually combine the intravaginal estrogen with DHEA. Yeah. Um, and that can be helpful, right? Mm -hmm. As well. But you just have to be able to like have some patience and just know that there are other options. Right. Uh, it's like not the end of the world if it didn't work the first time. But like you said, it's just like the patients having the time. And then one thing that you said at the beginning, which um, I just wanted to give voice to because I've had patients who come to me with this, it's like not feeling comfortable in their body. Yeah. Right. Like I've had women who are just like, I'm, you know, yes, I want to have sex with my, with my husband or my partner, but I just don't feel comfortable in my body. So they're looking yeah. for like quick weight loss solutions or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so then it's just like, how do you get that person to be more comfortable in their body? Right. You kind of have to, you can work with them, right. If they want to lose weight, you mm -hmm. can work with them, but it's sometimes I think it's like how you feel, right. Like if, if yeah. I'm working out, I, this was like something personally, I know that when I'm working out to feel good, yeah. I'm like less worried about how I look. 
Right. Right. So then it's yeah. just like, what can we do like in your daily life that's going to improve like your self-confidence while working towards your goals? Cause you don't want to dismiss that. Right. But that's also going to make you feel good in the process. So you're not like waiting six months or a year or whatever it is so that you can yeah. finally like enjoy sex. Exactly. And I, you know, I think too, is that what I think a lot of people don't realize too, is that once you're, you're going through perimenopause and you start going into menopause, I've heard so many women, including myself, where one day I just looked in the mirror and it's like, I saw these hips that, that came out of nowhere. And it was because my estrogen level was low. And mm -hmm. so it was, you know, sometimes it's, it's hormonal, but then you also, you can't just, you just can't hope that the hormones are going to do everything you have to eat right. And you do, you do have to exercise. And if you do exercise, your mentality will be better and your physical, you know, appearance is going to be better. And what you put in your mouth too. Like I, I've talked to women that are trying to lose weight. I'm like, and I, I can't lose weight. I'm like, well, what are you eating? And then mm -hmm. all these unhealthy foods they're saying, you know, and I'm like, well, this is why you're not losing weight. You know, you can exercise, but then you can go home and you can have a slice of pizza and, you know, and have a milkshake, you know, and you, you know, you're like, well, I don't understand. I go to the gym five days a week, you know, well, you know, look what you're doing. You're all the calories you went to the gym and burned, you got right back, you know? And then, so it's like, it's, it's, you kind of got to do it all. You know, you have to, you know, you have to just eat right. You have to exercise. You don't have to exercise like a crazy person, but you got to exercise yeah. a little bit. And I think, you know, I think hormone replacement is so important. I think, you know, a lot of those women who don't feel good in their bodies, I think, you know, sometimes it's because their hormones are imbalanced and your metabolism is slowing down and you, you, you it's like almost virtually impossible to lose that weight. But if you get your hormones balanced, you might have a chance. Yeah. And sometimes I, you know, if you just balance your hormones, you're exercising it, some people see like really quickly the benefits if they're already living like a healthy lifestyle. Sometimes, like you said, if you're not eating healthy, um, it's going to take a little bit longer to yeah. make those changes. But something that I thought about, I was talking to my sister-in-law a couple weekends ago is also this idea that like, I think some people are just, um, too hard on themselves. Yeah. Cause I, we were walking into like this party and I think I was like wearing this dress. I don't know. I was like being silly. And then I was just like, you know, maybe I should work out more. And then I thought, I thought that in my twenties, right. Yeah. And then I was like, and then after that, like I thought it again, like in my early thirties and like, now I'm thinking about that. And then I was just like, like, when are we just going to be happy and like, accept like our body the way it is. Yeah. Right. Because I feel like sometimes I think like, I'm going to be like 70 years old and be like, wow, like I wasted all this time, like being so hard on myself. hundred percent. Yes. Right. So I think that that also has to be something that like we talk about with people because I just yeah. think that we grew up in like a society that's always like talking about, you know, what we look like and you know, for some people, maybe they grew up with like a body dysmorphia or yeah, they're just like never happy with their body. So, you know, just to say that, because I do think your body changes a lot with perimenopause and menopause, but it's also just like accepting that your body is going to change regardless of whether yes. you're on hormone therapy or not. You're not going to look like you did when you were 18. Yes. And you have to realize too, that you have a different body structure than the person yeah. next to you. And, you know, I'm not going to look the same way as a Victoria's Secret model who's six foot tall, you know, like I'm five foot one, you know, there's going to be a little difference in the leg size and, and the hip structure and everything else, you know? Yeah. So, you know, you can't, you can't compare yourself to others, you know, and, and, you know, to beat yourself over the head because, you know, you put this, this figure that's not realistic in your head. You know, so many people did that, you know, especially growing up because when I grew up, it was just like the skinnier, the better. Now yeah. it's like the opposite, but you know, it's, it's become unhealthy because now people are not caring as much what they put in their mouths. And now they're getting, you know, they're getting, you know, illnesses and diseases because of it. So Either way, you have to find that happy medium. And I, I really think if you if you take care of your body and you exercise a little and, and you really keep up with, you know, your, your your you know, the supplements and the vitamins and and you, you know, make sure as a woman that your hormones are balanced so you could have a normal libido, you know, you'll feel so much better as a as a woman, I think. No, I agree. I agree. And I've been um doing some courses on nutrition and it's crazy how nutrient deficient we are just like in general i think yeah. it was like less than 18 percent of americans get what they need as far as like vegetable and fruit intake less right. than 18 percent. so then if you think about that like you said taking your supplements and your vitamins um that those nutrients and vitamins are not only playing a role in like your hormone management 
but they affect your mood as well. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So, cause I just, I got off a call today with some, one of my patients and like, she's like, I don't like vegetables, you know? And you're just like, ah, but you got to eat vegetables, you Yeah. know, because there's things that you're going to get from eating vegetables and fruit that like, Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess you can take a supplement, but it's really not the same if you're like eating pizza uh, Right. and you're not going to feel the same. You know, I, I, I call out to those people, like I went to a retreat, it was like uh, the Red House Wellness Retreat in Utah, and they had intermediate fast in there. And it was a chef there and he cooked all vegetarian. So it was all vegetarian food. He made the food where it didn't taste like vegetables. Like you had like zucchini spaghetti. You had no clue that you were eating zucchini. He made he made all these different dishes. Everything was vegetables and you did not taste the vegetables and anything. So if you if you didn't like vegetables, you didn't even know that you're eating vegetables. Yeah, that's how good of a chef this guy was. And I got to tell you, when I came home, I felt so much healthier. My body was functioning so much better. just by eating vegetables all week long and not eating so frequently and having a little spanned out and drinking more water. And it was like, my body did it. Like, it was like a reset. Like you were talking about, you need that renew. Well, my, my body did a total reset. And as long as you can, you don't have to do it exactly the way, you know, they did it. But if you could keep that healthy, you know, routine going, you know, not exactly, but, you know, something healthy that you could do, it's amazing how food is like medicine. If you could eat the right foods in your body, it's like, it, it's huge because your body, if it doesn't recognize it, it stores it. If it's toxic, it stays there. And that will affect your libido too. People don't realize. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that will definitely impact your libido. Uh, so yeah, there's just like a lot of different things to touch on. I have like specific questionnaires in my clinic uh, Mm -hmm. when I'm working with people so I can try to narrow it down. Yeah. Um, three day food journals, right? Where I'm like trying to figure out like, Right. okay, like desire or is it a function and what's their diet look like? Are they moving? Because Yeah. like everything is going to really impact um Like, I mean, we're talking about libido, but just like your health in general, but specifically it can affect uh, your libido. And then also like, are these people like moving or exercising or like doing something Yeah. Yeah. um, physical? Because like we said, that's going to affect your blood flow. Uh, so that was kind of just like, uh, like the overview, right? It's Yeah. physiological, then it's also the desire part. And you got to look at all the lifestyle aspects that we've already talked about. Um, and then just looking at your options as far as like medications go. Right. And the only, you know, bad thing about the medications is that they're relatively new for, for women. Yeah. So then like getting that covered by um, insurance, you know, you, Right. you can see, but sometimes uh, that can be an option. But I, I was, and I've heard other women say this before, but an off-label use for Cialis, right? So Cialis is the erectile dysfunction Right. medication for men. Um, it increases nitric oxide, so it increases blood flow. So Right. I've heard women who have had uh, some success with Cialis, and I mean, that tends to not be as expensive, so that can also be used off-label uh, for women if it is a blood flow issue. What do you feel about like a lot of times now I see it more and more commercials and, and not commercials, but like on the internet, you know, the ads for different supplements and different things to increase your libido and da, 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 da. But these are, these are supplements that people are taking that are increasing the levels in their body, but they're not watching it. And, you know, our hormones can, I don't think people realize, I don't know if they do realize, but our hormones control our entire body. And I think it was, it, is it testosterone that controls just four, 400 things in your body? I think it is. And so it's like people are playing around with elevating certain hormones in their body, but if they're doing it off the counter, how do they really know what they're doing to their bodies? Because it could affect so many different areas. You know, I feel like it's dangerous that they have these supplements over the counter that are increasing, you know, testosterone, they're increasing progesterone, that are increasing libido. You, you see it all the time, you know, ones for hot flashes, but all these things, if you're not being monitored, you can so easily get, you know, cause problems for your body. Like many women have gotten cancer, breast cancer from high estrogen levels because they weren't monitored. And, you know, so you play around with things. If it's done incorrectly, you could cause a lot of damage. If it's being watched by a, by a doctor and it's being, you know, and you're getting, you're getting blood levels and everything is being monitored, then you're safe. But what do you think about all these over-the-counter things that they have right now?
treatment for the purpose of like altering their hormones without knowing your baseline. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's first and uh, foremost, I would say. And then the other thing is that you don't really know what you're getting in some of these supplements. Like they might be selling you, you know, it has this, that, and the other, but you don't really know, right? Unless it's like a reputable source. Um, I've also seen like the opposite. I've seen women, and this is, I've seen more commonly who are like, oh, I have um, an estrogen imbalance and they'll start taking like DIM, Mm. right? And what they're actually doing is that they're driving their estrogen way, way down because DIM brings down the estrogen. And then they'll come to me and they're like, I'm super tired. Like my hair is falling out. Like like, all these symptoms. And then you look and they've totally like destroyed their estrogen levels. Oh, wow. Right? So I've seen that one very commonly. And, And I mean, it just goes to tell you that, like you said, you need to kind of know what you're working on because- If you don't really know, like, is is your testosterone that you need to work on Mm -hmm. or is it your estrogen or is it your progesterone, then you just, you can't safely alter it. And also it might take longer. Like I said, like these women who came in because they were trying to fix their estrogen levels and they come to me and I'm like, actually, no, like your estrogen is now too low and now you kind of got to work backwards, right? So then it takes longer to achieve whatever goal that they were trying to go towards. Right. And, you know, I think- Hormone testing is something that you do have to ask for unless you're seeing a functional medicine doctor, right? You might have to ask your primary care doctor like, hey, like I want my sex hormones uh, tested. And if you don't have like insurance, there are companies that for a lower cost will do like blood work for you. And that all goes to say that there's no reason why you should be starting like these uh, supplements to change or alter your sex hormones without like knowing where you're at. Yes, that's a very good point. And I think you made another great point is that you don't know exactly what you're getting. A lot of people don't check the ingredients and there's so many fillers. And so like a lot of companies, what they'll do is they'll put a bunch of ingredients and the one main component that they're supposed to put in the in the um in in the uh product they put the least of and then they put all these other fillers in there and it ends up being really unhealthy not doing a lot you're spending a lot of money and you're kind of hurting your body at the same time and you know and and you know if you're not if you're not doing it right i i i suggest you know my own opinion is is don't do it at all yeah and then you know it's a safety thing too especially if you're someone who's on a lot of medications yeah uh, because it could be counteracting or affecting a medication, you know, one of the other medications that you're taking and you don't really know. Yeah. Um, so it's also a safety issue. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Now tell everybody about the different things that you do in your office and what you help people with. Okay. So, uh, my company is called healthful roots. I do telemedicine for women and I work with men as well, but mostly, uh, women and, it's all like hormonal based, right? So I work with women on fertility, perimenopause and menopause. But when you're working with someone in any of these areas, like we have already talked about, you cannot ignore lifestyle, right? So we look at uh, diet, how you're moving, how you're managing stress. I have a lot of questionnaires. Uh, So I have like a symptom questionnaire. I have the female hormone questionnaire. And then I have one that kind of tells us like, is it stress, right? Like, or these are symptoms of like burnout or like how someone who's having a hard time managing stress. So based off of these questionnaires, we'll like formulate a plan, right? We were looking at nutrition, you know, are you exercising too much? Let's change that. Are you exercising too little? Let's do that. Um, And then the plans normally are like three months minimum Mm -hmm. to four months if you're doing fertility. And what I want to add for next year, because it's just becoming like increasingly evident of how like even people who eat healthy, how we're, they have gaps, right? in their nutrition. So starting next year, we're going to have a nutritionist who's also working with my clients um, to kind of just help bridge that gap because, you know, even me, I think I eat healthy, but then like recently through like testing, I'm like, oh man, like there, I have a lot of gaps that I need to fill. Yeah. And uh, I just think that that's going to be important because I can say like, hey, like take this like medication to help your libido so that you have like more sexual desire. Right. But, like if you're just like sitting on the couch all day, like in a dark room and you're not really like going out and like seeing sunlight and walking and like that doesn't really help you. Right. And yeah. so what I want to focus on in my um, practice is like, yeah, not only how can I get your libido up, but how can I just make you feel better? Like overall, right. because we want to not only like increase your lifespan, but your health span and make yeah. sure that your quality of life is as good as it can be like Mm -hmm. while we're living. Right. Exactly. hundred percent. 
Now, if you had to take today's conversation and you wanted to like summarize some of the important factors that we talked about today, what are some things you'd like to emphasize on? Well, I would just like to comment that uh, when it comes to like libido and sex in women, it can be complicated, Mm -hmm. right? So when you're kind of navigating the space to find a provider who has some experience with this, uh, just because I think it's really going to impact the direction in which your treatment goes. Uh, so that's like the first one. And then the other thing would be, you know, we've harped on it a lot is like not to neglect um, all the other lifestyle changes that you can make. So let's say that you're not in a place where you want to like go. Better even after that. Mm -hmm. And where can people find you? So I have an Instagram and my handles at Healthful Roots MD. I also have a podcast, Healthful Roots MD. Uh, and then my website, which is www.healthfulrootsmd.com. And I also offer uh, free 15 minute consultations for anybody who like has questions on what working with me looks like, or just questions in general about, um, you know, whatever topic it is that they're seeking help for. Excellent. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. I'm so glad you talked about it today because I think, you know, so many women have so many issues for, when it comes to libido. Like you said, everybody's different. You could have five patients that walk through the door and everyone has a different issue and different symptoms. And even if they have the same issue, someone would like, might be experiencing something completely different than the other because everybody's body is different. But, you know, I'm so glad you came on the show today to talk about libido because it's such a prevalent, you know, topic when it comes to women. And, you know, when you get to a certain age, if, you're, if your libido isn't functioning properly, you know, it, it affects you mentally and physically. And, you know, and it can affect your relationship as well with your partner. So, you know, it's something that really has to be addressed. And I think people should definitely look into hormone therapy. I am I am definitely one who, who definitely, I, I, I have gotten such a, it, it's changed my life completely. And, you know, and it not only did it help me with my libido, but it, it helped me with everything from, from energy to mood swings to everything you can think of because all my hormones were off balance. And once they got it back to balance, I felt like I was younger again because everything was functioning the way it's supposed to. So, you know, I think what you're doing is great. And I like to thank you so much for coming out and talking about it and being proactive about it. Well, thank you for having me. It was an interesting conversation. Yes, it was. Thank you so much for being here. I'll talk to you soon.